Welcome to KJV Cafe, where we explore great truths from God's holy word in a simple, down-to-earth fashion. Romans 10:17 shows us where faith comes from. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's grow our faith together in the cafe today. Our program is hosted by Pastor Clark Covington and brought to you by Heartland Ministries. Grab your Bible and a hot cup of coffee or tea and join us now as we explore God's holy word. Thank you for joining me today. Good to be here. So glad that you are here with me at the cafe today. And today we're picking up where we left off last time on our 15-minute KJV short episode. Uh, This is part two of a two-part message on disobedience, what the Bible has to say about disobedience. And before you change the channel or turn it off, because I know a lot of people don't want to hear about that, they want to be disobedient, if you will, this actually has a beautiful message to it. Uh, This this message is beautiful because it reflects God's love, his long-suffering nature, and the cure to disobedience or Christian rebellion or lost person rebellion. It it discusses the cure, the remedy. Amen. So hang in there. This is a good message, what the Bible has to say about disobedience. Now, if you listened last time, you'll remember we went over Proverbs chapter one, verses 23 through 33. And uh, hopefully you heard that. If you didn't, it is a wonderful piece of scripture that deals with um, how God, I believe, would respond, as the, the Bible shows us, to disobedience. And it, the idea that, that uh, you know, God had uh, given his counsel and they wouldn't take it. People wouldn't take it. He would have reproof. You know, he tried to reprove people and they would not take it. They despised it. So not only would they reject God's reproof for chastening, but they despise his reproof and chastening. And uh, they end up eating the fruit of their own devices. Uh, they end up even leading the simple astray. And they'll have to answer for all those things. Uh, And yet those that hearken or listen unto God will dwell safely and be quiet from even the fear of evil. Not just quiet from evil or safe from evil, but safe even from the fear of evil. Amen. And that's a wonderful message that God gives in Proverbs 1, 23 through 33. Also outlining how he deals with disobedient. And that's just a one of many scriptures. If you go through scripture, you can clearly see that God calls Uh, people to be obedient, whether it's Israel, his chosen people, whether it's the Gentiles that have been saved uh, and that are now part of the body of Christ, or whether it's the lost person that he, that he wishes none, uh, none, none pass away without coming to a repentance, coming to a knowledge of Jesus Christ, the savior and Lord, Uh, whoever it is, God's calling for obedience. And so where we left off last time was looking at Why? Why, if we understand in our minds that God wants us to be obedient, why in our flesh or in our bodies do we not act obedient? And then uh, the scripture I gave is James 1, 14 through 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Well, James 1, 14 through 15, very familiar verse, talks about man being tempted, drawn away of his own lust. Okay, so so we, uh, we are disobedient from our own lusts, but then we're enticed. Well, we're not enticing ourselves. Who's doing the enticing? Oh, that's the devil. See, because the devil, if he can get you to sin... And he, you know, he knows a lot more probably about God's principles than we do. He knows that if he can get you to sin, that the wages of those sins are death and lust conceived equals sin equals death and death. How does it manifest itself? The death of the spiritual. You know, if you are living a sinful life, you cannot have a close fellowship with God. Amen. Uh, that famous verse, draw, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you, you know, uh, of all this sinning, you know, go and repent before God. Um, you must be holy, sanctified. Amen. The whole picture of the Old Testament uh, temple and all of the things, the Holy of Holies and how they had to only a certain priest could go in there once a year and they had to wash themselves from head to toe and have special garments and everything. It was all a picture of God's holiness, right? Well, what happened to the veil uh, of that that Holy of Holies, that, that covering of it, that veil was rent in two or torn in two when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He paid the sin debt for all mankind. And so when we accept Jesus 
Jesus as Savior, then we are then given access to God. He doesn't see our sinful nature because he sees a forgiven sinner through the blood of Jesus. Amen. But when you are living in sin, unrepentant sin, let's say you're not saved, that's the death of the spiritual. Uh, that could be the death of God even dealing with the wicked. You know, the Bible speaks of God turning uh, these wicked people over to a reprobate mind or, re- or giving them a recompense or w- re- letting them reap what they sow. And so they sow evil and they reap evil. Uh, it's also the death of peace and joy. When we're sinning, we can't have true peace, godly peace, because we have sin in our life. It's the death of a hope for a future. You know, if we're not saved, amen, then we have no hope for a future. God wants to give us hope. He wants to give us an expected end. But we have to have that salvation that only comes through Christ. And when we're living sinful and in rebellion against God and we will not turn to God, that's death of a hope of a reconciliation, as the disobedient reject Christ's free gift of salvation. You know, we are given the ministry of reconciliation, those of us that have been saved. Why? Because we are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, through his blood, amen. And he has left us here for this season until he calls us home at the rapture, or if we have a natural death, whatever it may be, when we're to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord for the believer. But he has left us here for this season, to recon, help reconcile others to, to God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how we are able to approach that throne boldly. That's where, how we, we as unholy sinners are able to have fellowship with a holy, 100% righteous God. It's only by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And so we see that disobedience, it gets in the way of it. And if Satan can just get you to be disobedient all the time, then you'll be far off from God. You'll have reprobate mind and you'll be joining him in hell Uh, unless you're saved and then you'll just be miserable because if you're saved, once saved, always saved, we believe in eternal security, not a works-based salvation. It's nothing you can do. Uh, The Bible actually says that our our righteousness is like dirty, uh, filthy rags. Amen. So our righteousness is nothing to God. Uh, But if you're saved and you're disobedient to God, you're missing out on heavenly rewards. You're missing out on fellowship with God. You're missing out on closeness with God. And as many preachers have pointed out in the past, if you're saved and you're consistently disobedient with God, uh, to to God's ways, and it doesn't tear you up and it doesn't convict you, uh, then you really need to check if you're really saved. Amen. And I'm not trying to preach anyone out of their salvation, but you should be feeling a conviction. I know uh, myself, uh, if I sin, if I mess up, I'm immediately repenting before God. I feel awful, right? And that's the way it should be for the believer. Uh, but so many today, it's they don't even know, you know, or they don't even know when they're sinning. They don't even know what God considers a sin, and that is the problem. And so we have to look at where this disobedience roots from. And I've already kind of given you a hint to the solution, and it's in Christ. But where does it, where does disobedience root from? It roots from that lust of the flesh. Uh, a few other scriptures that, that speak on disobedience that helps us to understand what God has to say about it. Uh, Jesus Christ here, Luke 6, 46. Luke 6, 46. Luke is one of my favorite books in the Bible. And Jesus speaking, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Oh, what a powerful verse. If you really think on that verse, many people at that time were calling Jesus Lord and they were rebellious, disobedient sinners. They didn't really believe he was who he says, said he was. Amen. And many people today call Jesus, uh, call themselves Christians. You know, theoretically they, they would have made Jesus Lord of their life in theory, but then Jesus is responding here, uh, through Luke and, and, uh, Chapter 6, verse 46, well, why are you calling me Lord when you're not doing anything that I say? I mean, think about this. If I called someone master and I was completely rebellious to their commands, or if I called someone Lord and I was completely rebellious to their commands, did I really think that they were Lord? Did I really think they were the master of my life? Absolutely not. That's a great test to see if a believer really is one. Are they really making Jesus Lord of their life? And this disobedience, it's timeless. Look at Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. There was disobedience there. I mean, uh, God had clearly said, you can eat anything but this one fruit, right? And what does Eve do? She eats of that fruit. Well, how did she eat of that fruit? She was tempted by who? The devil. She was enticed, you see? So she was enticed. The devil appealed to her sense of pride and wanting power and curiosity and all these things. And she was disobedient to God. They were disobedient at the times of Christ, as I've shown you in that uh, rebuke there in Luke 6.46. And there's all the same rebellion today. 
Where do we see, see this today? We see it in the world, and we also see it in self-professing Christians that live like the world. Uh, and then think about love, love or lack thereof. John 14, 15, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. If you love me, if ye love me, keep my commandments. If ye love me, keep my commandments. I had this printed up on a t-shirt, amen, because it's just such a... a powerful verse. I mean, it, it really does cut. It really does step on toes. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Again, Jesus speaking, saying, okay, you say you love me. Keep, Go ahead and keep my commandments, what I've commanded you to do. The implication here is if you don't keep or even bother to know his commandments, you don't love him. How do you treat those that you love? Do you care enough to know about them and to, you know, learn what they like and to dislike and try to uh, meet their needs and so forth and follow what they want you to follow? I mean, again, it goes back to the previous scripture. Why are you calling him Lord and not uh, not doing what he says to do? Why are you saying you love him and then you deal with him despitefully and, and you and you hate him and you're rebellious against him? Uh, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that wage of sin is of disobedience is death. And you get a payment or a wage for that work or your behavior, right? And that's what your wage, you're, you're given a payment for what you've done. And your payment for that disobedience is death. And we have to understand that without personal salvation, by trusting in Jesus Christ, it's not possible to, to be reconciled by God, to, with God. It's not possible. He is the only way. Uh, no man cometh to the Father but by him. Amen. And so we must look to change. Uh, in Ephesians 2, uh, chapter 2 there, in the beginning, it speaks of, uh, you know, in time, uh, uh, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in the time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us or made us alive, us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we see a good picture of, of what's fueling disobedience, the devil, but we also see a good picture of how Christ has freed us from that life and, and how we can get over all of these, these uh, hurdles in our life that we deal with of, of sin and reproach and how we can just give it to God, how we can just live for him, how we can be saved and mean it and have that testimony about us that we no longer are the children of disobedience. We no longer are rebellious and we really should embody that. We should look at, hey, are we being enticed? Are we following the lust of our flesh or are we turning to Christ for our satisfaction? Are we making him Lord of our life? Are we understanding the the pay, you know, the debt that this, that Christ paid on the cross? And when we understand that, we are free from sin. We are free from uh, condemnation, amen. And so what we need to do is live like that and have a testimony to others and a witness to others to show them that they too can be free in Christ. And that's why it's so important to be saved and understand the gospel uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4, and also to share the gospel with everyone that we can day in and day out through gospel tracts and through testimonies and through preaching every way that we can sharing the gospel of Christ. If we do that, we'll be fulfilling the Great Commission. And more importantly, we'll be showing Jesus we love him because we are obeying his commandments. Thank you so much for listening. I look forward to talking to you again soon. God bless you and amen. Thanks for listening to this episode of KJV Cafe. Have a question for Pastor Clark? Email him directly at clark at enduringpromise.org or visit kjvcafe.com and click the envelope button on the homepage. Our program is hosted by Pastor Clark Covington and brought to you by Heartland Ministries. We'll close today with Psalm 119 verses 166 through 168. Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and done thy commandments. Commandments. My soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies, for all my ways are before thee.